We always bring to any conversation our past history. In 2011, my wife and I had the privilege of spending a couple of weeks with my mom and dad and my brother who were living in Hawaii. And that time, we always did something special every day. My brother took us to a different place on the island to watch the sunset. Some of the most beautiful sunsets I have ever seen. When I said that, what did you picture in your mind? A sunset. Okay. Red reflecting on the water. Red reflecting on water. You develop, as I talk, you develop a picture. What is the picture that develops in your mind if I told you that on the drive over here yesterday, I saw a lot of cops? Accident, okay. Flashing lights. Behind me? No. <laughs> but there's a picture that develops in your mind. Um, and this is true no matter what is said. And this is the challenge that words have. Because the picture that's in my mind that I'm trying to describe with words won't necessarily be the picture that's in your mind with the words that I am using. This is the challenge of studying the Bible. Because words will always bring specific images to you. Without responding, I want you to honestly, brutally honestly answer the question for yourself, what is your picture of God? If you were a child growing up at the time of Christ, you would have heard stories. Stories about God. Stories along the lines of the God of Cain and Abel. Genesis 4, 5-7. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. a picture starts developing in the child's mind. Stories about God of the Exodus. In Exodus 19, verses 10 to 13, 
And the Lord said to him, go to the people and tell them to spend today and tomorrow purifying themselves for worship. They must wash their clothes and be ready the day after tomorrow. On that day, I will come down on Mount Sinai where all the people can see me. Mark a boundary around the mountain that the people must not cross and tell them not to go up the mountain or even get near it. If any of you set a foot on it, you are to be put to death. You must either be stoned or shot with arrows without anyone touching you. This applies to both people and animals. They must be put to death. But when the trumpet is blown, then the people are to go up to the mountain, not on the mountain. Exodus 25. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. The God of David. 2 Samuel 6, 5 to 9. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? or the God of Israel at the Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah 20, 5. The Lord himself has said, I am going to make you a terror to yourselves and to your friends, and you will see them all killed by the swords of their enemies. I'm going to put all the people of Judah under the power of the king of Babylonia. He will take some away as prisoners to his country and put others to death. I will also let their enemies plunder all the wealth of this city and seize all its possessions and property, even the treasures of the king of Judah, and carry everything off to Babylonia. What picture of God is developing in that child as they listen to these stories? It's easy to start seeing a God that demands strict obedience. A God that says, don't ever cross that line. Matter of fact, that was the conclusion that the Jews came to that came back from the Babylonian captivity. They understood that they had broken the covenant with God. They went back and discovered in Deuteronomy the blessings and the curses and that the curses is what had happened because they had not followed God. And they made a conscious, committed effort to never disobey God again. So, If it was Sabbath, how many steps could you take before it became a journey? What was a burden that you could not carry? 
But if you sewed it on your clothes, then it was part of your clothing. It wasn't a burden anymore. We laugh at some of these things because they're foolish. They miss the point. But when God is that police officer that's hiding in the median, just waiting for you to come by at 71 miles an hour, What other picture do we have? And it's against this thinking. It's against this picture that Christ comes to this earth at the appropriate time. He comes for the specific purpose of showing us who God is. And it's drastically a different picture. I want to ask you again, what is your picture of God? Is it the one that draws the line? Is it the one that demands strict obedience? Is it the one that's ready to punish the minute you're out of line? You know, I grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I am very thankful for the parents that I had. Because that's the picture of God I was taught. The four of us kids never really understood what the big deal was about swimming on Sabbath. Because we had parents that didn't make a big deal about it. Yeah, you can go waiting. You know, up to your knees, not a problem. So as kids said, yeah, okay, up to our knees. We started doing handstands. But only up to our knees. Today, I would like to adjust your picture of God slightly. Maybe this isn't a big adjustment for most of you. Maybe it's a huge adjustment. I don't know. First off, we're going to start out in God's second book, Nature. You see, God likes variety. You can look at anything in nature and see it. When I first start thinking of God and nature, I immediately start going underwater. But today, I'm going to go up in the air. The smallest bird that we know of is called a bee hummingbird two and a quarter inches long and doesn't weigh the weight of a dime. Tiny. The biggest bird with a 10 to 12 foot wingspan. Charlie, or anybody, do you know how long the pews are here? Hmm? 13? So you got a bird that has a wingspan of these pews. 
weighing 20 to 30 pounds. Huge. You have birds that will fly at as slow as five miles an hour. You can run faster than they can, than what they will fly at. And then you have the peregrine falcon. By the way, that's the American wood, woodcock. The peregrine falcon, 68 miles an hour, plus or minus, level flight. 185 miles an hour in a dive. You have birds of paradise. There's a whole group of those. Craziest birds that you've ever seen. They have feathers that do nothing other than make you wonder why. Some of them have tail feathers that are feet long for a bird that's not even six inches long. Birds of almost every color, every shape, every size. And that's just birds. Take that example and turn it into people. Have you ever met a person just like you? How many people are there in the world? Eight billion, is it now? You know, once, once a number gets past the millions, it's kind of like, eh, who cares? I can't comprehend it. Eight billion people in the world, and you have never met somebody just like you? God loves variety. God likes you just like you are because that's how he created you. God doesn't want all of us to be compressed into a specific model of a Christian. He wants us to be us. Turn with me, if you will, to Mark. Mark chapter 10. God really loves children of all ages. If you remember the story, Christ is teaching. He has a crowd around him and he is teaching the people. Now, Christ drew crowds. Why did Christ draw crowds? Because people liked being with him. It wasn't drudgery. It wasn't sit still, be quiet, don't move. People loved being there. Christ loved having them. As they're teaching, the head elders and the deacons, well, let's just say the disciples, react to this, starting in verse 13 of Mark chapter 10. Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. That's the mothers, the parents. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. 
Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. God wanted the children there. Can you imagine a worship service going on, let's say at camp meeting, Sabbath divine worship, and all of a sudden a mother with two little children walks up on the stage and walks right up to the person talking and says, would you bless my children? Tanya, I challenge you. <laughs> what would happen? From a few years ago, what would Jesus do in that situation? Well, according to the text we just read, he'd say, yeah, come here. He would take the time with that child. When he got done, he would go back to his teaching maybe even with the child sitting on his lap. You know what's better? We have sinned. We have been separated from God. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Here is something that's truly amazing. Romans 8, starting in verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Can you imagine being right there standing beside Jesus as all of the angels glorify both of you? That's what it talks about. Why be afraid of a God that wants you to stand beside him? That wants you to share in the glory with him? The Bible teaches us that we are children of God. One other text. This is a passage that we have been through many times. John chapter 14. This is getting into 
the crucifixion weekend. The disciples have been with Christ for at least three years now. They have been listening to him teach. They have been um, understanding new things. Peter has been given the revelation that Christ is the Messiah. Who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah, the Son of God. Blessed are you, Peter, because you didn't get this from this world. God told you. John 14, starting in verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. God, the Father, and Jesus are the same. The God that we saw in the Old Testament, the God that these children grew up being afraid of, because if they crossed that line, they were dead. And Jesus Christ who they were happy to sit on his lap, are the same. They are the same. Several years ago, there was a pastor gave a sermon this was down in Keene, Texas, and <laughs> it's been over 32 years ago. So you know that it stuck with me. He talked about a dream that he had. He said he, his wife, and his two young children made it to heaven. They were standing on the streets of gold, just taking in the sights. They're looking around, and after a few minutes, he turns and looks at his wife, and they both have this big, wonderful smile on their face. And they turn to look at where their children were standing, And all they see is shoes. They look up and down the streets of gold are their two children running and sliding on the streets of gold in their stocking feet. <gasps> oh no. They chase after them and just get up and grab hold of them about ready to let them know that this is not proper behavior in this place. When around the corner comes Jesus, followed by hundreds of children, all sliding on the streets of gold in their stocking feet. That's my Jesus.
one other story. Again, down in Texas, another sermon. It happened to be Pathfinder Sabbath. And the person talking told about a painting that was in a new retirement center. South side of Fort Worth, Hughley Hospital is an Adventist hospital. And they had built a assisted living retirement center on the property adjacent to the hospital. And it is the day of the grand opening. A local artist had been commissioned to paint a picture of Jesus in the lobby. And as the director is walking through in the morning, getting ready for the grand opening, she looks up at the picture and with horror discovers that Jesus' eyes are just slightly crossed. She calls a painter up and says, you won't believe what happened. You've got to come fix this. The painter says, I would never paint Jesus with his eyes crossed. It can't be that way. But I'll be right down there. He came down, they stood there, looked at it, and sure enough, Jesus' eyes are just slightly crossed. So he got out his brushes and a ladder and a few strokes of his brushes, and Jesus' eyes were straightened out. And the pastor said, you know, I wish they hadn't done that. Because my Jesus, I can see, laying on the grass, nose to nose with a young person, staring at each other with their eyes crossed. God doesn't want us to obey out of fear. Yes, God wants obedience. But he wants obedience that comes from a thankful heart. He does not want obedience that comes from a heart that is scared to death of him. It's a fine line, and you can step across it very easily, and we do, all the time. But please understand that Jesus loves each one of us. Jesus wants you to be in his family. Every one of you. Because he created you unique. He created you to be a special part of his family. And it won't be the same if you're not there.